we are live. 07's The Kingdom Review and Thoughts film. Yes, the 2007 movie, not the 1994 Danish miniseries. Now, I realize this video is long. If you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. See its length, check the time codes in the description box. I am currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies I watched, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. Let's see. And I got it better. And right, here we go. I start this video with a review with zero spoilers. Certainly, if I do spoil anything, I will warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler. So you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself and get into the thought section, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for this movie. If I spoil something else, I will warn before doing so and hold on my index finger. And this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie in another tab. I promise I won't mind. And since we are still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it's possible I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I've washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. So I have watched this movie somewhere between three times and five times. I think the first time I watched it was 2009. And the, yeah, the most recent viewing was today, right before now vlogging about it, so it's fresh in my mind. Now, if, you know, for, for the potential viewers of this, if you have epilepsy, there are some flashing lights in this movie, and if you're prone to motion sickness, you may want to skip this movie entirely. It is, there's a lot of shaky cam. Plot. When a Saudi Arabia-based American housing compound is attacked by suicide bombers, a small FBI unit goes to investigate the source. They do have to do some cajoling to convince the Saudi Arabian leadership to allow the FBI in. And, let's see, and they're obviously going to be in a lot of danger as long as they're there. Now, if this is something you've never heard of, this is an action drama thriller. If I had to, I would say most of, of the three, it is especially a thriller. There's not a lot of action, but the action is really great. And so yeah, 2000, it's from 2007, and it was directed by Peter Berg, who had been known more as an actor before he started directing in 1998. And the style is very heavily influenced by producer Michael Mann. You can tell that he really, you know, Peter Berg really wants to make a strong impression since this is his first action blockbuster. And the concept is basically a fairly standard American police procedural sandwiched between, you know, an, an opening set piece and, uh, I guess, yeah, it's a sandwich between two action set pieces and it's also got some buddy cop going on. There are a number of reviewers who straight up refer to this as CSI Saudi Arabia, CSI Riyadh, which is the town city. Sorry, I don't know. Got to stop apologizing. But Riyadh is the specific place that it's set. And yeah, calling it CSI, that is legitimately a good point. It does come across as that content wise and stylistically. The a lot of the middle section is these brief scenes of people investigating. Like, it, it feels like CSI with a bigger budget. I, I should say up front, I have fairly little experience with CSI, but, you know, I've, I have watched other... I've watched way more NCIS, for example, than CSI, and a lot of Law & Order as well, but I am very familiar with the CSI sort of... Yeah, the style I, the the style that that show goes for. Now, I I would definitely say that this movie was worth making. I do have some issues with it, but those I will get to. 
Now, I would say this focuses more on the investigation than the characters. There's not a lot of characterization. And, let's see. Some people do think that it is style over substance. I disagree, but I definitely do see what they mean. And... It, it is a movie that somewhat simplifies America's role in the Middle East, which, you know, a lot of American movies made about the Middle East after 9-11 were very eager to try to downplay. I'll admit that I haven't watched that many from before 9-11, but after 9-11, they definitely try to downplay. They, they don't want American viewers to think about you know, how, how did America interact with Middle Eastern countries and people? I'm not saying, obviously, it's crazy that this has to be said, obviously 9-11 was not any American's fault. An argument could be made that Bush really should have taken that report seriously that literally said, Bin Laden determined to strike within U.S., but I'm not saying that America was to blame, but I am saying that if America had treated the Middle Eastern, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get into all the, all the details, but there are, you know, there, there were a lot of Middle Eastern people's, you know, concerns that were ignored. Because America liked to have military bases here and there, and they liked to pump oil here and there. Now, the IMDb More Like This list compares this to Green Zone, Miami Vice, the 2006 movie, not the TV show, Body of Lies, SWAT, and the Danish miniseries, Real or The Kingdom. So yeah, that last one, that's because of the title. There's no other reason. The, the, these two have nothing else in common. But yeah, you know, Green Zone and Body of Lies have the have a very similar setting. I would overall say Body of Lies, I have to admit, I only watched it once when it came out in, in theaters. I really, really liked it, but I, I have forgotten a lot of, of details. So I can't make a very detailed comparison of the two. But I do remember that as being a better movie, and it is, it's probably a combination. I, th I think the script for that was better than the script for this, which is not, there's definitely a lot good about the script for this, but it does have some issues. And if I recall, Body of Lies was directed by Ridley Scott, and as long, like, Ridley Scott's Kryptonite is a bad script. If he... If he starts making a movie and the script is good or even great, he makes an incredible movie. And that was one with a really strong script. And yeah, so Miami Vice and SWAT, definitely it's it's the, the style that, that, you know, that's the reason why it's it's on the MDB more like this list. And yeah, you can you can really tell. And and some people say that. Jamie Foxx plays the role in this basically the same as in Miami Vice, I have to admit. I only watched it once. I'm almost certain it was over a decade ago. I do not remember. And and the show, I I don't think I've ever watched any of the show. So it didn't have some kind of emotional impact for me to see. I, I don't even know. Are they supposed to be the same characters as the show? I know they're not the... I'm not, I'm not completely ignorant on it. I do know it's not the same actors. The show was like Don Johnson, I want to say, and he had a partner. And then in the movie, it's Jamie Foxx and Colin Farrell, because they are significantly more marketable than Don Johnson was by 2006. But, yeah. But certainly, the, this does some things that Body of Lies doesn't do, and yeah, again, overall, I do think it was worth making this movie. And for those who might not know, the title refers to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And... 
I really wish I didn't have to say the following. I hope someday in the future it will simply be considered obvious, like water is wet. But I'm not Islamophobic, and I would definitely say I don't think this movie is either. I would not be giving such a positive review to something Islamophobic. I'm not saying it's entirely unproblematic, and the climax and ending have significant issues, and I will be calling those out in this video, but one of my main arguments against the idea that the movie is Islamophobic would be that one of the characters we feel the most sympathy for, the most empathy towards, is one of the Muslims of Saudi Arabia. I guess I get it if some people think it's cheesy or an easy way out that, you know, one of the ways, to, you know, we learn that this Muslim actually loves at least some American television. That's one of the ways that we can recognize that he's not that different from us. You know, I it would be nice if it was something more neutral or maybe even something actually like, uh, what's the word? If, if it was a, a thing that more, you know, that, that was considered to be a typical Muslim thing, maybe even a typical Saudi Arabian thing, instead of an American, you know, obviously it's, it's to reassure the, the, you know, middle American view, you know, audience member in the, in the theater sitting there going, I'm, I'm starting to like this Muslim guy. I, I don't, I don't know if I like that. And then he starts talking about, oh, you know, the, the, I, yeah, I don't think I'm going to go into exactly which ones, but, you know, there, there are several American TV shows that he really loves. And then it's, ah, okay, you know, that's, it's, it's, the shows are from like the 70s, so it's not necessarily that the middle American audience member watching this in theaters in 2007 grew up watching those, but they know of them and they know that it's like, you know, they, they don't, when they hear those titles, they know those are very American shows. It's not some, so, so, yeah. And I, I would never say that this movie is flawless. It is perhaps inartful in how it goes about humanizing Muslims, but in my opinion, it does get there. It does humanize Muslims. And let's see. Obviously, it would be great if the movie could humanize Muslims without the need to put a bunch of Americans, most of whom are white and or men, in a majority Muslim country, but there is at least an expectation that a white American audience are simply not going to be open to a movie that has absolutely no white Americans in it. That they simply won't be able to empathize with someone who is too different from that. So what this movie does is put people like that in this area and then have them get along with at least a few of the local people. And thus the movie communicates to a white majority of American audience that they too might like these Muslims. Is it frustrating that the movie feels the need to do this? Yes. Does it ultimately work? Does it humanize these Muslims? Also, yes. Now, let's see. I I've discussed this movie and its reception with a friend of mine. We both love it and find it odd that it wasn't much more positively received. Now, we have a theory, but it would require me to spoil the movie. I... Yes, I think I will very briefly. So... Spoilers for this movie until you see me lower my index finger, so mute and skip ahead if you don't want to hear the ending. Our theory is that a number of Westerners found it offensive that the movie says that basically the urge to get violent retribution for those fallen in combating our ideological enemy is equally strong, equally a driving force for Westerners as it is for Middle Eastern based Muslims. And my friend and I agree that this is humanizing for Middle Eastern-based Muslims. And it came out in a time when an extreme number of Westerners did not believe that Middle Eastern-based Muslims, or Muslims anywhere else in the world, had any humanity, deserved our empathy. And part of the reason that I review it today, when it's 14 years old, is that sadly countless Westerners still don't believe Muslims have humanity. 
there's a huge difference between regular Muslims anywhere in the world and radical Islamist terrorists. I don't believe that somebody who has crossed the line into committing acts of terrorism, regardless of our, their ideology, still deserves our empathy, although it is obviously useful in trying to defeat them to try to understand why they do it so we can keep them from doing it again and try to prevent the radicalization of those who haven't yet quite crossed that line. I guess maybe some credits read the movie as being in favor of revenge. I would say that the argument against that simply is that Janet does go to Saudi Arabia in order to get revenge, and all it does is lead to more deaths in the future. Nothing is actually resolved by them going for revenge. If the movie were in favor of revenge, then I think the ending would show the next group of terrorists, represented by the scared boy whose grandfather tells him to get revenge, giving up and or seeing Americans as the good guys, something like that. No more spoilers for the movie for the time being. But yeah, the, the main reason I decided to do a video on this is I think it does a great job humanizing Muslims. And that is also why I originally, the, the reason I originally bought it. Now, the script was written by Matthew Michael Carnahan. Now, I have no, oh, let's see, right. He wrote State of Play, which I remember liking, but I, I don't remember anything other than that. I, I might remember the cast or something. Other than that, like he's written some big movies like World War Z and let's see. He wrote the movie Lions for Lambs, which I haven't watched, but that's apparently also about Muslims and you know, depending on which review of this movie you read, that movie is either great and really understands it, or terrible and misrepresents it, like this movie does. You know, so, yeah. I do think that he... He did a really good job on it. He had... Like... He... there, there There's very clearly... There are a lot of things that he thought about how to, you know how how to find a balance between appealing to a middle american audience yeah middle american audience and making something that is respectful to muslims and doesn't just make you know and yeah at times sadly the movie does you know it it def there are definitely times where it's too much, it's, it's all, it goes all in on trying to appeal to middle America. I'm not sure I would say that there are times where it goes overboard. I think you could, in, in humanizing Muslims, I think you can make an argument that there is a little bit, there's, some of it is kind of cheesy and, and obvious and kind of, but then at the same time, when you read the reviews of this, and I read, you know, I read the, the top 100 voted most useful IMDb reviews, and I read every single review that I could access on via the IMDb external reviews section. And yeah, you know, some people, there's people in the middle, there's people who think that it did. A great job appealing to um, it, yeah appealing to Americans there's people who think that it did a good job you know showing Muslim you know, humanizing Muslims but there are also people who watch it and still leave it and and you know like focus on that there are you know that they, they watch the movie and what they take away is there are Muslims that white Americans have to go kill. And that's, you know, so, so yeah, there are definitely times where it doesn't get the balance right. Now, there are definitely some aspects of the investigation where in real life, Americans would not be allowed such free access to some of these areas, especially considering one of them is a woman. And, and another thing, you, you know, you can really tell when you read a review of this, 
not always, but when they, there, there are certain things that they mention where, like, there, there are people who, yeah, it's, it's not a spoiler. At, at one point, they say that the, the Americans will not be allowed to touch the dead bodies of Muslims, you know, who, who the, the, yeah, there, there are both Americans and Muslims who died in, in the, in the, the bombing attack. And, yeah, if, you know, some reviews, some reviewers straight up say, I can't believe they think that people need explained that for Muslims, you know, that, that in Muslim culture it is considered, a, I'm going to go with unacceptable, for non-believers to touch the, the dead bodies. And then on the other hand, you have people saying, I don't even understand. Why, why aren't they allowed to touch the dead Muslim bodies? So, so it really, it, some, some things you just, you cannot please everyone. I think that it would have been, I, I, I'm almost certain that there is no, they don't directly explain why it's unacceptable. But they do say, you know, you, you Americans will not be, you know, one of, the, one of the Muslim characters tells the American FBI agents, you will not be allowed to touch the, the dead bodies of Muslims. Now, over the course of the movie, it will sometimes cut to Abu Hamza, the, the bomber, and his people. So, you know, maybe in part to distract from, there's, there's really not that much action in this movie. And there's a long chunk of the movie with basically no action. But it, it works well. You know, we see them recording videos talking about the, the upcoming attacks. We see them working on building bombs. You know, the, these kinds of things, it, it helps to make sure that they have a very sort of permanent presence. Like, the part of the, the idea with this movie is saying, what if there were some American federal agents investigating it, and they were in the actual, you know, they were actually in a Middle Eastern country where, you know, somewhere in Riyadh, there are these terrorists, you know, so there is this sense of, of, you know, essentially, they could attack suddenly. And this is a concept that does need some explaining before we're willing to accept it, and it does a pretty good job of explaining. I've, I've seen a number of people criticize that it spends as much time as it does, but I, th I think it's important to remember, like, there, again, there, there are Middle America movie reviews of this movie where they say, I don't understand, why don't they just let us go over there, not appreciating how, how touchy a subject it is, and you have people who know a lot about the area say, it's very hard to believe that that's all it would take, so... It's, it's very, the, I always read a lot of reviews before I do one of these, well, always, recently, I make sure to read a lot of reviews. In, in the last, uh, couple of years, I guess, this is one of the most, like, the, the, there are, there are different sides to it, and it's, you know, I, I try to hear everyone out. But you can really tell there are, there are, there's a lot where there isn't a lot of agreement. But yeah, it basically, it doesn't spend an awful lot of time on basically the, the politics of it. It just shows, I mean, it's not, it's not quite a montage, but it's not hugely far off. It's, it's this like maybe five really short scenes and it is like apparently this was trimmed down significantly originally it was an almost an hour longer 45 minutes longer and yeah there are times where you can really tell that they they trimmed it down to just get like some some scenes are extremely brief and they just like you can't remove the scene because then something that comes up 
simply doesn't make sense anymore. But when you trim down the scene so much, it will lead, like, especially the first time you watch this movie. W once again, I've watched this multiple times, so I knew, you know, okay, we have these, we have a little bit of politics, and then they get to the investigation, but it is, I mean, it's a movie that, that at the very start, you have this big attack. Then you have a while of just, you know, people talking about, like, the F this, this, let's see, four FBI agents want to go to Riyadh and investigate it. And then you have several people telling them they can't do that. And so they, you know, then, then you have Jamie Foxx's Ronald Flurry going around basically manipulating situations in order to make sure that they can go there. Then they go there. Then they're told that they basically can't do anything there. And, the, you know, there's a little more playing politics. And finally, you know, it feels like a really long time. I think it's maybe 35 minutes into the movie. They can really start the investigation. And by then, it's been like 30 minutes since we saw the bomb itself. And that's not, it's not that all of that time that they basically, they, they trimmed it down basically as much as it could. And the very first time you watch it, you feel it's very, ah, what's the word? The word I'm looking for, it's, the, there's a lot of starting and stopping. It's, it's, it kind of gives you whiplash every single time you think, okay, so this is what we're doing. We're, the next several minutes is going to be seen of this particular thing. Then very suddenly the scene will end and it'll go to something different. But once you, once they start the investigation, the movie does work more and yeah. If you can't stand CSI, if, if the idea of CSI with bigger budget in Saudi Arabia really puts you off, then this is not a movie for you. Nothing else in the movie is going to change the fact that a substantial chunk of it is CSI Riyadh. Now, the movie handles plot twists quite well. There, there aren't too many, and they're... They're pretty good. The, there's a little bit too much like coincidence and guesswork, kind of, but overall, the the they do a good job with it, and the twists aren't too easy to figure out for the viewer. It's not difficult to keep up with all the twists. You don't need to like check Wikipedia. I will say, for a while, not very much happened. There wasn't a lot of, like, they would start doing things and then it would cut to something else and cut back. And they're still doing that thing, but nothing new has really been discovered. And then near the end of the investigation section, suddenly they discover something incredibly important. And then something, like, by, by then I was kind of, I was, I had forgotten from other viewings exactly when the investigation, you know, took a turn. And so I was kind of just used to, well, you know, people are doing things and they seem to be discovering something, not quite sure what. And then suddenly it, something did actually happen. So that was, but yeah, I, I don't, I'm not sure there's that much that they could have done to make it. It's, yeah, it's, it's a very difficult, delicate balance. But I... I do really, I love the, the directing, I love the, the, I mean, I would say the stars, but really the entire cast, they all, like, there are, there are some people in there that I don't, that I'm not that familiar with, and they just, they do incredible work, and I want to watch them in something else. Now, the direction, it tends to be pretty focused, but it does have... Yeah, I'd already mentioned the, the problem that there are sections where you're not sure exactly what they're accomplishing with the investigation. It just, like, visually all you can really tell 
is that there is investigating going on. Now, so yeah, the, the director is Peter Berg, and he was known for acting before he started directing, and he has acted some since he started directing as well. Honestly, the only thing I've seen him direct is this, but certainly, let's see, he directed Battleship, which I, I try to avoid both Michael Bay movies and movies that are very similar to Michael Bay, and I forget if, I think it might have been Lindsay Ellis who pointed out that Battleship is basically, like, it might as well have been directed by him. And I, I've only seen the trailer, but it certainly does look like it. And he directed, right, Peter Berg also directed Hancock, and it's possible that I watch, that I will watch it at some point. But I've heard, I guess I haven't heard that many terrible things about it. But a lot of the things I've heard just kind of conveyed that it's probably not really worth, like, even if you, even if you can watch it, like, if you can rent it at a low rate or something, borrow it from a friend, it's probably not worth spending the time on trying to get invested in the story, because by the end you will regret having watched it, is, is basically what I've gathered. From, from reviews and such, but, and, yeah, so he direct, he also directed Friday Night Lights and Very Bad Things, and, yeah, so the, the, let's see, I, I will say, I definitely do think that, you know, you, you can tell that he, he chose to work on this, he wasn't, like, made to make this movie, and his passion and interest does show. You can you can really tell, you know, he may not be the best director in the world, but he does definitely care about I, I don't know if it's true of all his movies, but with this one, he definitely he wanted it to to come out as good as it possibly could. And he did appreciate that it isn't just yeah, I, I saw at least one person say that he basically, he brings up America's cowboy attitude and, and you know, kind of approach to dealing with bad guys, regardless of where in the world they are. And the reviewer pointed out, Peter Berg doesn't just, like, th this is, you know, some people have said this is like Rambo. Some people have even gone so far as to be specific enough to say it's like Rambo in the Middle East, which I guess means they're not familiar with the third movie, you know, Rambo 3, set in the Middle East. Yeah, fair enough. It's not that great of a movie. But <sighs> parts of the movie do play like Rambo, but... It definitely is a movie that is trying to have sympathy and empathy towards the people, you know, the, the actual Saudi Arabian people. And it, it is the, the I, th I think the, the reviewer said that Peter Berg brings up and explores the cowboy attitude. And I do think that there are times where it appeals too much to that sensibility, to the middle American cinema goer who just wants to watch Rambo 3, basically. You know, Rambo 3 in 2007. But if, if the movie didn't... Let's hypothetically say that the movie didn't even bring up that kind of attitude. I think that would have... The, the movie wouldn't have worked as well. The, the, the fact that it is in parts... When you just look at the four FBI agents and the way they play politics to get to, to go to Saudi Arabia on official FBI business and these kinds of things, 
the the way they talk and act some of the time. You can, yeah, there is the cowboy attitude, and that's that's part of the problem to begin with. Is that America has gone into the Middle East many times with a cowboy attitude, and that's you know that has made a number of things much worse than if they went in diplomatically and tried to make sure that like you know obviously the 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 Saudi royalty who benefit from the oil they personally don't necessarily mind you know they they don't want to look like they need America's help because the you know the the it can't look to the to their people like they need American America's help but they themselves don't necessarily mind that America treats the Middle East the way it does, but a lot of their people do. You know, a lot of regular, a lot of regular Muslims do resent America for the the way, the, you know, the cowboy attitude that it has brought into the Middle East. And I think if the movie just, like, if they did act, if 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 no if no FBI member acted like a cowboy in this movie then it wouldn't like because once they are in yeah once once they go there once they are there and some of the time are still acting like cowboys it does kind of bring up yeah like hypothetically if the movie it brings up that tension is what i'm trying to now, yeah, so the the opening of the movie is very effective. Basically, the very, very start is this documentary style kind of thing. Like, you know, they, they go into some really important facts and dates and such that get you up to speed on the history of Saudi Arabia and the U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia. And once again, depending on who you ask, it's either talking down to you or a slick way to engage the audience and prepare us for the rest of the film. Personally, I do think that it does a, a good job. You know, it's, it's maybe three and a half minutes long. Some people don't think it should be there at all. I would definitely say there are a lot of people who watched this movie that there are at least some of the things that were important to know that they probably didn't and i i think it's it's frustrating when they put that on this movie they should be putting that on the american press and their you know inability to tell nuanced stories about the middle east and america's involvement it's, you know that's that's where the real problem is it would be great if they didn't have to have that at the start of the movie but they do because a lot of americans simply don't know very much you know to them to a lot of americans the middle east is just a place that terrorists come from they they don't know much of anything about it and you know i've i have studied it some in in history class and obviously it's oversimplifying but how long would they possibly expect it's possible that that this was another thing that was trimmed down that originally it was like 10 minutes or something. I, I don't know for sure, but they they had to get at least some of these details across because otherwise things that happen or are said or such later in the film would, would basically come out of nowhere to a lot of American viewers. And after the you know the the documentary thing then we have the the softball game and the bombing of that and you get a good sense of life in this compound the people who live there so when the terrorist attack is carried out it feels personal it feels like it hits close to you and i don't just mean the fact that it happens to americans we learn like there are several like you don't get to know these characters but you do get several like 
close-ups of them being really engaged with the the softball game and you know it, it's others have already said that it's pretty ridiculous that you know of all the things of all the things it possibly could be it's a softball game but again they they felt that they needed to appeal to the the average american and it, it is really effective. It is an effective way. I'm pretty sure I'm not American, but I, you know, based on having watched many, many American movies, it's something they care about a great deal, and it feels basically sacrilegious to attack a softball game. Now, the ending fits well with what came before. I, I do have some issues with the, the ending, but I do think there are some things that really work well for it. Now, I know some people would say that it utilizes Deus Ex Machina, but it doesn't really. The, the, you know, there is a sudden occurrence, yes, but it's, it was set up before then. There are a few coincidences close to the end of the movie that, you know, it, it doesn't, it sadly doesn't completely steer clear of writing crutches. And, yeah, the ending resolves everything. You 100% understand why the ending happens the way it does, why it couldn't have happened sooner. And... I wouldn't say that the movie loses your interest along the way, but without a doubt, the middle section of the movie that focuses on the investigation is a lot less compelling than the action scenes themselves, and the... I, I don't... See, that makes me sound like someone who does love... I love the first Rambo movie. I don't love the rest of them. Let's see. It, it is the... It is the 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 sort of thing of the the action scenes work really well. There are also there are some great character moments between the action scenes, also in them, but those work really well. But the investigation itself just it doesn't feel like very much is happening, and you know then suddenly there is a major ah, what's it called a major revelation. And that just basically almost ends the investigation the moment that they realize that, and then the movie just moves on from there. So it does it 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 doesn't feel earned in a way that I can imagine before it was trimmed down. I think it probably the the investigation was more compelling, but you know, the, I think. I really hope that someday in the future we will be more... Well, I mean, I mean, I need to finish that sentence before I start a new one. When this movie was made, there wasn't a lot of room for a longer movie. Today, at least some movies can, you know, are allowed to be three hours long and such. So maybe, you know, hypothetically, if this movie had been made today, Maybe it would have been two and a half hours long. I can definitely imagine that the two and a half hour long movie is better than the, the one we have. Now, this, right, that gets us to the characters. And, right, one of the critics point out that it's really nice there is no romantic relationship in the movie. And it also says the chemistry between the fed really works. I agree on both counts. 100%, definitely. It's, the, 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 a lot of people say that they, the characters don't get a lot of character development. And that's very true. But you do kind of recognize them and they feel like, I mean... In reality, we know these are just 
actors who, you know, some of whom hadn't even met before they started making this movie, and, you know, they spent some weeks or months filming this, and during that they had to pretend that they'd known each other for years. And they have to do such a good job of that that when we sit down and watch the movie, we feel like they've known each other for years, and it works. You know, I for sure there, there are frustrating moments of characters, you know, of, of the FBI guys in this, and the one gal, but you do get the sense that they they know each other well, they they know what they're doing. Now, the four Americans are, yeah, the four FBI agents are cowboys in the, the cowboy archetype. In addition to being competent, they're always joking around, they're ridiculously calm in some tense situations. You know, the, the, at one, at one point, they're, you know, they're being slowed down by local rules about how much they can do investigating. And they're forced to stay inside this locked gym for a while. And Janet, played by Jennifer Garner, starts talking about how being locked in a gym with a hoop and a basketball for, for an extended period of time, how that would affect your ability to play basketball. You know, instead of talking about the dead people, they went there to investigate the death of. And when they're in the gymnasium is also when one of the characters says, we're in the jungle now. I think there's a chance that whoever came up with that line didn't think about how racist that sounds, but it should not have made it into the movie. And another one calls it a bit like Mars, which also not... Yeah. And obviously... A black guy, a white girl, and a Jewish guy in Saudi Arabia would not lead to a great working relationship. I think the filmmakers were patting themselves on the back for proving that America is so much more progressive than Saudi Arabia, forgetting how bad things are for those three groups in America. As I record this video, there's an American member of Congress who believes that Jews are behind the problems of the world. Enough of her voters thought that kind of person would be good to have in Congress. And it's not like this movie thinks that highly of women either, since when the news of the death of the federal agent at the start of the movie is revealed to the federal agents that we meet, the only one to cry the news and need a hug is Jennifer Garner's Janet. Because this is one of many movies that think that men don't cry, or at least shouldn't. Now, obviously, in real life, crying is natural and actually healthy, so I'm not saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and put up air quotes. The movie is basically saying, those women, they just can't help but cry, even if they're FBI agents, and it's just... and it didn't need to be there. Now, I've seen some argue that the one Saudi Arabian that we really get to know is actually a much more complex character than most of the American characters, since they're largely one-dimensional stereotypes. Yeah, I, you know, Colonel Ferris Al Ghazi is probably the most complex character in the movie. And as far as black people go, we finally got justice for one of the countless black people who have been killed by cops. And several conservatives said, oh, you know, without that, there would probably be riots. Because as usual, they care more about private property than human lives. Or I guess a lot of them would say black people should still be private property. I saw a user where you point out that an early scene of this, you know, Jamie Foxx character, Ronald Fleury, takes a call while talking to a classroom of children and not showing strong emotion when clearly something awful, you know, he's being told about this terrorist attack. And the, the user where you pointed out that's probably supposed to rationalize that's why Bush waited for so long before leaving the photo op that he was at when the call came and told him that 9-11 had happened, which is just, it's ridiculous, and it's really gross, and it's sad that there are still, there are, there are, there are way too many people who are accepting Bush 
as not that bad. And I'll grant, in a lot of ways, Trump was worse. But that doesn't mean that Bush was, wasn't still terrible. And I've, I've seen some point out that the movie makes the Saudi prince look like a brat easily swayed. Sadly, the I agree, that is how the movie makes him look. And again, that is mighty rich for a movie made during the Bush Jr. presidency. I mean, you want to talk about someone who clearly doesn't have the mental and emotional maturity to be a leader. Someone who is easily swayed. I mean... I forget exactly who it was that said it, but someone pointed out that basically you had you just had to be the last person in the room with Bush. That that would be the person he listened to, and a lot of the time that was Dick Cheney, which I I don't know you you don't have to be a very savvy person to realize that Dick Cheney has awful intentions. Like the, when when you when you hear him talk, when you look at him as he's explaining political things or talking about political things, you can tell that he like he he looks so guilty. I I don't mean that he looks like he feels bad, but he looks like I'm, I mean if you like green screened a building on fire right behind him and had him in front, we would immediately say he set he set that building on fire. It's just he. He's, he was never particularly good at hiding his intentions. Anyway. Now. I think the movie would be a lot more compelling if every main character was Saudi Arabian, but obviously wouldn't have gotten as big of a budget in America, and way less people would have seen it. Ultimately, whether that trade-off is worth it you know, that's that's up to the individual. I do think that there were several things in the movie that work, despite the... Yeah. One of the frustrating things about this and other American-made movies and such about the Muslim world is that frequently Muslim is shown to be excited or passionate. They're depicted as evil, and the Muslims depicted as being good people are frequently a lot more restrained in their expression of emotion because a lot of, to a lot of American moviegoers, if you see a Muslim and he's really excited and or praying, it means he's about to carry out a suicide bombing. Now, I do really appreciate this movie does actually depict Muslims praying in, I mean, I suppose it's, it's probably more a neutral light than a positive light, but certainly... Yeah, th there is at least a little, and you know, outside of outside of this movie, I have not seen that much of it. You know, on the show Aliens in America, they actually call out Americans overreacting to the sight of Muslims praying. If this movie were made today, I wonder if it would have the terrorists attack a second time, targeting first responders as the movie does. Since today we know that the American military actually did that countless times. I'm not sure very many people knew in 2007, so the movie does get a pass on that one. That was something that we thought only terrorists did. The American military never did. Now, I've already somewhat said the following, but to expand more, too much of the investigation is pure luck. They stumble upon clues. For a chunk of it, such as Janet examining dead bodies, she, yeah, she is eventually allowed to. We aren't told why they're doing the individual bits of investigating. I mean, obviously, you can learn a lot from examining bodies. Everyone who's watched a CSI episode knows that. But what are they learning? What is that that we're seeing? Like, you know, you, you see her, she's using like, uh, crap, what's it, what's it called? Uh, yeah, the little pinchy thing to pick up like fragments of, you know, like bomb fragments from the dead bodies. I know that that's what I'm see that that's what she's picking off and I can see that, you know, okay, so 
she already took a bunch and there's a bunch more to go but is she learning anything from it like the the movie is just the movie's basically just telling us that's something she's doing so that like hypothetically if you removed it from the movie we would be like oh where's janet what's what's janet doing right now but it, we wouldn't actually I, I don't think it does lead to anything I'm, I'm not going to give away exactly what does lead to something but yeah some of the investigating they're like they're looking at clues and i don't i guess they're learning something and it's again the prob if the movie being trimmed down might be one of the biggest problems because it really does like the the there's a little bit of stuff in there there, there are a number of things where the movie has just briefly shows something, and again, if, if you removed it, we would feel like it was missing, but it still feels like it's incomplete. Yeah, you know, it, it just, like, the... Uh, it's frustrating that the American characters so frequently and flagrantly ignore Saudi Arabian norms and rules. Imagine if it was the other way around. Middle Eastern people coming to America to do something they specialize in and expecting Americans to just accept them ignoring the rules. Just and and when the FBI people are arguing for getting into Saudi Arabia to, to do this investigation, they're warned that it would be you know, it would be dangerous for them. And one of them responds, we try not to say anything. We try. Ignoring the danger of being... Americans being in Saudi Arabia, especially if they're law enforcement, it, you know, that's completely different from being in America. It's... it's Yeah. So, yeah. Jamie Foxx plays Special Agent Ronald Fleury, and he's... Basically, he's supposed to be very easy to relate to, and a lot of the time he is. He's introduced talking about the birth of his son, talking about it being the happiest day of his life. It's trying ridiculously hard to make sure we empathize with him, identify with him, so that we don't think anything he does for the rest of the movie is wrong. How could it be? How could it be wrong? The birth of his son is the happiest day of his life. He's just motivated about keeping his family safe. It's it's really ridiculous. And at the same time, like, hypothetically, you could definitely have trimmed down, like, you... He's he's talking about the, the birth of his son in front of, like, I don't know, six-year-olds, six maybe, some something like that. They didn't have to have... It's several minutes. And, and once again, this is a movie with a lot of very short scenes. So it's spending several minutes on it. I think it's because for the rest of the movie, you do see him do some really messed up things. Like, he is extremely manipulative when it comes to him making sure that he and the other FBI agents can go to Saudi Arabia. Like, the, I'm, I'm not going to go into details, but yeah, like, it's... And... Let's see. I mean, it is legitimately impressive. The, the kind of, yeah, how he makes it. Now, let's see. And Chris Cooper plays Special Agent Grant Sykes. And, you know, basically his character is very experienced. It's hard to shock him. And someone pointed, one of the reviewers pointed out that... I mean, I guess that's technically a spoiler. I, let's just go with... No, you know what? Spoiling the movie briefly. Spoiling the movie Breach briefly, sorry. In that movie, he basically betrays the FBI. So someone wrote in a review of this movie that the the it's it was nice of them to allow him back in you know, since he betrayed them just the same year. No more, no more spoilers for Breach. He, he is really good at playing, like, the kind of, 
you know, a, a federal agent or a spy of some kind. And Jennifer Garner as Special Agent Janet Mays. She's basically in full Sydney Bristow mode for most of her scenes. I've seen some say that she can basically only play Sydney Bristow or an adorably girly girl, which is basically what she is when out of character. Now, one critic pointed out that the, you know, she's, she's made to deliver a lot of exposition and that is you know that that makes that leaves less room for her to be interesting and others point out she has some of the coolest bits in the action scenes absolutely some reviewers really obsess about the fact that her lips especially her upper lip is somewhat puffed up I'm not saying that they should care about either, but I do think it's interesting that the attractive woman is the one where they obsess about her appearance. Some of the men aren't all that attractive either. Once again, not saying they should care about either, but it's it's really ridiculous that, yeah. And... Jason Bateman plays Special Agent Adam Levitt. There's, he's, he's essentially the comic relief. Like, all four FBI agents will say things that are really snarky and sardonic and such. But he's downright, like, he's, he's probably the one that is the most, there's the most comedy surrounding. If you find him funny in general you'll like him in this, and if not, you might find him really annoying. I find him reasonably funny. I do agree with those who say that the type of comedy he provides is inappropriate for the film. I mean, I, maybe part of the reason that I, I don't... I haven't watched very many things that he's in. Let's see. This state of play in the sweetest thing. So, you know, he hasn't had much of a chance to... to get on my nerves and like I said I love a lot about this film so I'm I'm willing to accept but for sure like some of the the things that he says yeah I think I'll yeah I'll just very briefly give a per, perhaps the the most like a, a good example of it is that at one point, I, I forget exactly what he's about to do, but, you know, he's about to do something to investigate that requires he put on a role. Well, there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff where that would be, you know, and when he does, let's see, he, I th yeah, after, you know, he's, he's pulled on the, the rubber glove and he's holding up the hand and he looks at one of the Saudi Arabians and says, I, I forget if he says, do you need to get checked or do you want to get checked? But, you know, making a proctologist joke. And the guy, I'm, you know, I'm almost certain the, the guy he says it to doesn't understand. He probably doesn't speak English, you know. And I say that because of his reaction. He, he basically smiles, this sort of, like, goofy, friendly smile. You know, probably just, like, I think... To him, he's just thinking, I really don't want to get, I don't want to cause trouble. I don't want to enrage one of the Americans and, you know, have, have pro, you know, have that cause problem. So he does the, the smile and, you know, that's, I, I actually, I saw a pie graph once that literally said, you know, when some, when I, when I didn't understand or hear what someone said. And like, you know, it has, oh, you know, I, I asked what they said or, you know, this or that thing. And most of the pie, very, you know, that's how you know it was accurate and honest. Most of the pie just says, I laugh and hope it wasn't a question. That's what everybody does. It's not a, it's not a uniquely Saudi Arabian thing. But, you know, he goes off that and says, and, and implies the guy is gay. And that's just like... 
unfortunately, no one around, you know, cl clearly the, again, the, the Saudi guy doesn't understand it. But if, like, hypothetically, if he or one of the others understood English and, like, explained it to him, he might get really offended. You know, it's, they, they're, they're, the, the, the idea of being gay is very insulting to a Muslim, offensive to a Muslim, so... And, and there's, there's no reason for him to make this joke. Like, I could understand if it was, like, they're constantly pushing him, and so he ends up calling someone a gay slur. But no, he's, he's in a good mood. He's putting on the rubber glove, he's smiling, and then making these jokes. And it just, it's wrong for the movie. Now, best character in the movie, Ashraf Baham, plays Colonel Faris Al-Ghazi of the Saudi State Police. Now, at first, he's basically telling the FBI agents they have to follow the specific rules, and he comes across as unwilling to adjust to special circumstances, but he does start bending the rules because she can appreciate how important it is to investigate, and, you know, at, yeah, to quote one of the reviewers, he and Ronald are both family men driven by a sense of justice. There's a lot of humanizing of his character. We, the audience, really come to like him. He turns out to be incredibly likable. And we realize that just because at first he came across as boring and annoying doesn't mean that he can't be much more relatable. You know, there's an expectation of him having to live up to his own country's rules. And the, the actor ad-libbed and the director loved his addition, so do I. I, I don't know all of them, but the director called out some of them, and those were ones I really loved. The actor has an incredibly infectious smile. In a DVD featurette, we're told that he came to America for the first time to film this movie, and he was really excited about it, and his passion shows. He has really great chemistry with uh, Jamie Foxx, but yeah, all 100% really excellent actor. I wish he had become as big as Mark Strong. I'm not saying Mark Strong doesn't deserve the career he's had. He does. I'm saying I wish both of them had, could have had such a career. And let's see. Yeah, Jeremy Piven plays Damon Schmidt. He's basically, he, he works at the U.S. Embassy in Saudi Arabia. Some people criticize the fact that he's basically playing his entourage character in this movie and that it doesn't fit. I haven't watched Entourage, but I've seen clips, and as far as I can tell, that's... They, they, yeah, he is playing his Entourage character in this, and yeah, it definitely doesn't fit. It's I, I think it was that, again, D director Peter Berg liked his performance, and so he didn't tell him to tone it down, and I do think that was a mistake. I, I, I wish he had told him he has to be more, and... It's not, he's not even in that much of the movie, but when he is in the movie, the, the fact that he plays it like this is really just, it's, yeah. And Danny Houston as U.S. Attorney General Gideon Young. And again, not a big, not a big character, not in a lot of the movie. I could watch him be intense and intimidating for hours and never tire of it. And I think that covers the ones I want to see. Oh, thank you. Ah, my back. I think I gotta speed this up. <clears throat> we definitely empathize with the protagonist and yeah. Brief spoilers, spoiling the ending. Near the end, you do also empathize with the... Not not really the main villain. He's ridiculously sinister and evil all the time, but his, his grandson you do empathize with. No more spoilers for the movie for the time being. And, yeah, basically, you know, the, the humanity really shines through. And I... I'm glad that it came out like that, and I would definitely say it's intentional, and they made the right choice. And let's see. 
the the dialogue is there's a lot of snark. It's kind of again, I I think it's probably similar to CSI as well. It reminds me of NCIS since I've watched much more of that than CSI. And to be fair, NCIS and CSI are somewhat similar if you have dyslexia. But yeah, and and it somewhat sounds like how people talk other times. Both the writing and delivery are great. And the the characterization shows some of the characters in varied circumstance. You know, you see what they're like when things are going well, how they respond to things going wrong. I appreciate that a bunch of the time they actually, like the, the characters who are Saudi speak Saudi to each other. You know, Al Ghazi and other Saudis speak English when talking to the FBI agents, but when they talk amongst themselves, you know, they speak in Saudi Arabian, and they also speak in Saudi Arabian to their loved ones. It's not just like, again, that's a thing in American movies. If you're hearing, like, if you're hearing someone talk in a way that where it sounds Middle Eastern. You know, that's that's the cue to Middle America, cinema goers. You know, that's the bad guy. He's an evil terrorist. And I appreciate in this, like, you know, and, and something that helps is that the these lines are, I think almost all the time, are subtitled. So it's not, you know, like we, we have to, we have to sit and read to make sure we, we follow it, but it's not... We, we do understand what is being said, you know, and yeah, one of them, like one of the, one of the Saudi cops goes home. I, I forget if it's him asking his father or his father asking him, but one of them asks the other, how are things? Are you okay? Something like that. And again, that is like, it's, it's really obvious. It's, it's the, the kind of thing that, that like, it feels like, you know, why do we even have to put that in the movie? But it is necessary because some, like, the, the moment that you see that, you know, a father and son asking each other, are you okay? Is, is everything okay? And, and yeah, you know, that's, no, no matter where in the world you are, obviously some people can't. If you, if you have a bad relationship with your parents, you, you might not have that experience. But a lot of people can have that experience. Now, the cinematography is done by Mauro Fiore. And let's see. So the other movies that I've seen him DP are X-Men Dark Phoenix, The A-Team, the movie, Avatar, The Island, Tears of the Sun, Training Day, and Get Carter. Yes, I watched Get Carter. I also watched the original. I'm not... And the original is definitely... The, the remake is utter garbage. The original is great. But yeah, he's you know he's good at action movies. He's the the there's I think almost all of the time there's almost all of the time it's handheld. There are, there are a few shots. There's like a, a crane shot that is is actually kind of funny. And, and one of the featurettes they're like talking about you know and and one of them says oh you know basically all handheld and one of the others I, I forget if it's an f-bomb or he just says bs but he's like no it we have a crane right there you know and the other guys oh that's crane crane right there but uh, yeah I, I think he maybe took it personally that but almost all of it almost the entire movie is shot in handheld I'm not going to go into the entire yeah I'll just I'll just very briefly summarize some people basically feel like handheld means you don't have to do a careful job of cinematography you know you there's there's handheld or there's traditional and with traditional you can have some incredibly compelling shots you know and overall i do prefer traditional i i think some of the best movies ever made are filmed 
in in this traditional you know I I I should have written down better example but off the top of my head one of my favorite movies is the original Dark Man and that movie I'm really glad that's not handheld now obviously for some of it it couldn't have been handheld the the effects shots would have you know, if everything except effect shots was handheld, you'd immediately be able to tell the effect shots. But it uses the camera so incredibly well. Like, if you haven't watched that movie in a while, but you are but you remember liking it, especially if you want to appreciate the cinematography of it, try to watch it again. It's, it's really, really good. Like, I've watched that movie maybe ten times. I could probably watch it a hundred more. I, I love that movie, and I... I'm not apologizing for that. That movie has some really great cinematography. And you know, in general, Sam Raimi is is really talented with that. And it helps that for that movie he was working with the DP of the Matrix trilogy and Team America, Bill Pope, who is unbelievably talented. Now but yeah, the the it's almost all handheld. It's more intense during action scene, but there is there is at least some shaking in almost every shot outside of, of action scenes. And the reason there's handheld outside of action scenes may be because throughout the entire movie there's a lot of tension between the Americans and the Saudi Arabians. I would definitely say in action scenes, well, in general. In general, in this movie, you never lose track of what's going on. That's especially important for... Yeah, the reason I, I point out, especially for the action scenes, is some people do think that you lose track. I guess, you know what, I think maybe it boils down to some people... You know, I already mentioned motion sickness. I personally almost never get that. Like, the... the Gravity. I, I got it for the trailer for Gravity, which is why I haven't watched that movie. I'd like to, because I love that director. But the, the Alfonso Cuaron, I want to say his name is, Children of Men is a masterpiece. Anyway, other than that, and I, I, yeah, I don't even think, yeah, not even in IMAX theaters have I ever gotten motion sickness. So for me, it, I, I could imagine if you... If it's at all upsetting to you, then I think you might lose track. I I would argue that if it's not something that has any, like if if you don't get motion sickness, it's not giving you a headache. It you can you can focus on it and and always be watching the screen, which is after all what we're expected to do when we watch a movie. And again, I'm not criticizing people who can't if if physically you can't stand it, obviously, but I do think that. Again, like, if you've watched this movie and you, like, if you don't get motion sickness or the like, and you remember not being able to follow it, are you 100% are you sure you never looked away from the screen or checked your phone or something? Because I didn't, and I followed it without any problem. I was never, I never had trouble with the geography, where people were, what people were doing. Yeah. Now, let's see. And yeah, some say it's distracting, excessive, nauseating. No, no, I don't agree with that. I'm, I'm trying to, no, I, I simply disagree. I respect their opinion, but I completely disagree. And others say that it moves without purpose. That is true. There are times, you know, it's it's one thing like if you're if you're doing handheld and there's like people running and the camera, you know, moves to to so so that it, so that the people running are always in shot. That's just, that makes sense. But if if people aren't moving and the camera is like then it kind of needs to then it's then it would be best if it's moving with purpose and there are times where the camera in this moves without purpose and that is i i do think moving without purpose is almost almost never should happen for for camera for for a professional movie 
I do think that the handheld works out well. It puts us right in the action. I love it in the Bourne trilogy as well. So, you know, I do... This is the kind of thing that I wrote. But overall, I do prefer the, the traditional. And in Interview, the DP talks about a three-camera setup, which I don't think he expanded on, but I'm guessing means that every scene, they always have three cameras running, and I'm guessing at least one of those is close-up. At least one of them is like a medium or something. And yeah, when you do that, you can cut it together in a way where it, you know... Yeah, where it, where it works, if, uh, yeah. Now, let's see. Right, and the editing is done by Kobe Parker Jr. The only other movie that they edited that I've seen is Ant-Man. And it's also edited by Kevin Stitt, who has, let's see. Yeah, I'm just briefly going to go through the other movies I've seen that Kevin Stitt edited are Surrogates, Cloverfield, Electra, Paycheck, The Last Castle, A Knight's Tale, X-Men, Payback, and Executive Decision. And no, I'm not happy. Some of those movies I'm not glad I watched. Now, I, I do think that the, the, the editor really is, is capable of making, like, I think... If you if if the editing was bad in this movie, then you would lose track because of the handheld. But I think he did an incredibly good job, or they they did. Now some criticized the movie's editing, saying that too many of the shots last for such a short period of time, cuts too quickly between too many people, making it difficult to follow. I. I can kind of see what they mean, but I don't completely agree. Now, let's see. The special effects are quite good. And the stunts are great. And with both, it's the right amount. There's not so much that it's distracting. And the production design is quite good. You get a really great sense of what it's like to live and work in the different environments of Saudi Arabia that the movie depicts. Now, yeah, so some of this movie was filmed in Abu Dhabi, but a lot of it was in Phoenix, Arizona, and they, they did a really incredible job doubling. Like, in on, on the DVD, you can actually see like the the you know the the crew are walking around Phoenix, and you know they'll like indicate oh see that's something we added to the front of that building, that's something we added, and they'll intercut these still photos from the actual, I th were they all from Saudi Arabia? I f I don't remember if it was all Saudi Arabia, but certain you know yeah the the and. Yeah, they did an incredible job, and it's, you know, there, there were various reasons for not, you know, yeah, for, for not shooting it in the actual Middle East. And the movie does a good job of showing several different parts of Riyadh. And... And yeah, for the filming in Abu Dhabi, they got a lot of help from the local government. We're thrilled to have filming take place there. So the yeah, the the action is very tense and suspenseful. You know, it's it's this sort of mix of the the quick, tight, and dirty, and these grand, care, carefully choreographed and. Both the start of the movie and the end of the movie have, you know, had have action scenes. You know, so some reviews you read make it sound like the opening is just one or two explosions, but there's a bunch of shooting and driving and such. 
And the action, despite being filmed in the faux documentary style, is the kind of thing where the Americans hit with every bullet fired, and their enemies can't seem to hit with any bullet fired. So that is obviously, I, f I feel like if they, if they did one of those, but not both, then it would be less awkward. But the fact that it's this camera style that really puts you right there, and then, yeah, it's, it's really, really ridiculous. And the, let's see, the, the bombings are, you know, it's, it's not a horror movie as such, but the bombings are legitimately scary. And the villain is memorable, despite not having a huge amount of screen time. And the you really empathize with the protagonist, since everybody will experience at some point in their life that someone they care about dies. And that hurts a lot, perhaps especially when it's sudden and violent. When they die in their prime instead of, instead of when they're old from natural causes. And there is, um, let's see, yeah, briefly spoiling this movie, both the protagonists and the, the villain, you know, the villain very badly wants to kill the protagonist, and the protagonist very badly wants to kill the villain, because both of them feel they're right in their drive to, to kill the other, and that really works in the film, I think. No more spoilers for the time being. Now, let's see. The, the action scenes are meant to be somewhat chaotic. The, the director says in the DVD special features, I do find that the, it's not so chaotic that you just can't tell. And... The score is by Danny Elfman, and it's, it, yeah, it's very suspenseful and tense. Some of it sounds somewhat like it was actually composed by and for Saudi Arabians with, you know, appropriate instruments. Now, some critics say that it's, it's nice and subtle, and they couldn't even tell that it was. One second. Danny Elfman who did it. Others say that the music is always telling you what to feel before you feel it. And the the sound design, you know, like the handheld camera, the sound design make the action scenes chaotic and it feels like you're right there. There's not a ton of violence and gore, but it is very strong and graphic. There's sexual references. I think the they did a good job. Like it would, it could very easily get to be really gross and exploitative. The the especially the bombing at the softball game, and when like. Americans get to shoot terrorists and this, but they, there isn't so much of it that it just gets to be, you know, completely disgusting and awful. Some people think that there's too little, that you don't feel, yeah, that it doesn't make you feel anything, which I completely disagree with that. And I think at times the, the, the violence in amount and tone is inappropriate, but it does try to be appropriate. And it definitely does serve a purpose. Now, let's see. Overall, the realism is high.
now. So yeah, the the pacing is uneven. You know, the very very fast start and very fast end and very slow middle. Now it is an hour and forty five minutes long. If you count the end credits, without them, it's like forty minutes. And I, I would say it's worth watching at least once. If you're not interested, I'm gonna go with if if forty minutes into the movie, you're not just not interested in more, then it's not going to. I, I don't think there's gonna be anything else to win you. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess if you like rented it and you already paid for it, maybe you know just watch the the last 30 minutes or something also now the movie it's not the kind of movie that feels much longer or shorter than it actually is i think it's the right length though as i've already said i wish that it didn't like it's it's frustrating that so much of it has been trimmed down so significantly I don't think this, I'm almost certain this didn't start out as, now that I think about it, actually, I'm not entirely sure if this started out as originally a novel and this is an adaptation, I, th I could see how it could definitely work as a novel or a miniseries or something, because there really is way too much to cover for such a short movie. And I think some Muslims might find the movie to be disrespectful to, to Saudi Arabia, and that, yeah, I, I wish it wasn't. Now, there is some feminism going on with Jennifer Garner being smart and badass. I think, let's see, in 2007, was that still considered feminist? I, I'm not entirely sure. Now, the movie can definitely be somewhat preachy. I wouldn't really say it's a film that feels like it has room for dissenting opinions. Now, I, I would say the very best element of the movie is the humanizing of Muslims, the sense that we're not so different, Muslims and others. And I personally do recommend owning this. I, you know, it's worth watching multiple times. And if it's like, if, if you either stream it with like no special features or you can get a, a DVD copy or Blu-ray or something, you know, it, it has some pretty good special features. Now, yeah, the, the worst thing about this is the ways in which it basically fails to respect Muslims as a, yeah. Now, other, you know, from, from reading review, you know, of, some other, some people also think that it's, it's way too much of a cowboy thing, but otherwise, the handheld is something that got a lot of criticism. And, you know, Sadly, ultimately, there's nothing you can really do to, I, I don't know, take a, a dra Dramamine? Is that what it's called? Other than that, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid not. And I totally understand being frustrated with that. Now, let's see. I was probably most worried that it would really simplify you know, yeah, that, that it wouldn't have very much respect at all for, for Muslims. And, I, you know, I, I was pleasantly surprised. It, it wasn't as bad as I worried it would be. 
the thing I was most looking forward to was the humanizing of Muslims and the movie exceeded my expectations. Now, let's see. So the movie is entertaining to watch. It is saddening. It might leave you feeling kind of hopeless. And the movie is good as a whole. It doesn't leave a lot of unsa answer, ah, unanswered questions. I refuse to talk slower. If there and let's see, there are answers to the mysteries. The the trailers. There's two two and a half minute trailers on YouTube. I would say both of them give at least a little too much away. But then the the you know basically. In part, the, the trailer gives you a good idea of what the movie is like. Basically, the both trailers make the movie look a lot more action-packed than it is, when a lot of it is police procedural. But it does give you a really good sense of the actual action scenes. The cover and poster don't give away too much, and, you know, it, it they, they do make the movie look like a pure action movie, so they they don't really give you a good idea of what yeah of if you like it or not the movie does not have a lot of metaphors you don't you don't need to watch it more than once though it might you know you you'll appreciate it more i would definitely say the the other than the the you know aspects of, of you know, Muslims in Saudi Arabia that are very different from here in the West. Other than that, it doesn't have a lot of difficult to understand stuff in the film. Now, if you listen to the critics, you might have very, very low expectations of this movie. But other than that, it's not really... Yeah, if you've if you've never watched it and you've just heard a lot of people criticize it, you know, you you might actually like it if you did watch it. Now the yeah, the tomato meter, this has a 51%. Uh, yeah, based on 189 reviews and the audience score is 76% based on 250,000 plus ratings. So, yeah, it's uh, what's what's the term and um an audience movie or um, movie for audiences something like that. Now, and yeah, on Metacritic, it has 56 and the user is 6.3. And there's actually, you know, I'm not the only person who's watched this movie recently. There was at least some that were very recent, including January 21st of this year. And the IMDb rating is 7.0. That makes a lot of sense. Now, this was given an R by the MPAA, and I would definitely agree with that. Now, if you, I, I would recommend this movie to those who, you know, fans of police procedurals, fans of action movies, and people who want positive depictions of Muslims in movies. So I give this a 7 out of 10. And that is it for the review. So from here on out, spoilers. This is the start of the thoughts section. And this section is called Disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I'll try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section, and once I get into the rest of the video itself, with that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. 
I realize the video is long. I'm gonna do what I can to make it worth the time. So yeah, from here on, from here on out, spoilers for this movie without warning. If I spoil anything else, I will still warn. So let's see. Yeah, so content warning and or trigger warning for terrorism. Now, I don't have a problem with violence in gore in general. I think it's one of my favorite horror movies and works in general. I also love Cronenberg's Love Live, Video Drum, etc. I don't have a problem with films. Uh, yeah, with disturbing and upsetting material. Monster is one of my favorite movies. I might swear in this, probably just as quoting the characters and people making them such. Now, I got this movie on sale, so anything made me saying this is not out of bitterness. I just do not feel like the movie wasted my time, nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it to the best of my ability and the negative things I said in this video are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve. Instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say here that I loved every line they put in the IMDb Marvel quote section. So you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. I think that might be... Oh! It's a little bit too much of a hurry. So, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of this analysis, some of this MST3 riffbacks and other jokes. So the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. Now the section right after this one are thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting or the like. The section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. And final section, I get into stuff I think it's worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, MP, and Wikipedia. So let's see. I think that might be it for this section. I appreciate that this movie has room for female characters, even if, again, you know, Janet is not treated that well by the movie. But it's better than absolutely nothing. Notes taken while watching. So, let's see, the, yeah, so, it used to be that this section would open with something at the very start of the movie, but most of the stuff from early in the movie I put in the review, so the first thing I have to comment on is, you know, this, so before the, the, the four, feds yeah i think that's before the four feds go to saudi arabia there's this scene where al ghazi and haytham talk haytham is clearly upset because of the accusation that he helped with the bombing attack and al ghazi says use that frustration this scene would play a bit differently if the movie really did end with haytham blowing himself and the four feds up which was apparently how the yeah that was the original script i do think that would also like i get that i think what they meant to do was say that haytham was a good person but he became extreme and violent because he was treated so badly you know in, in this case actually by his own government but i think a lot of americans watching it would have just thought that it meant that every Muslim is basically a terrorist. Now, let's see. I already criticized that the movie has Janet cry when she's told that Fran died. I do appreciate that Sykes explains to Adam the background between Fran and Janet. Which, you know, that does help explain why she cries. So it's not just, you know, she's a woman, so of course she's going to cry. So the movie is more insulting to Muslims than it is to Americans. And it's, 
it's especially frustrating that it is so insulting to Muslims. I, a lot of the things that are insulting to Americans in this movie, I don't think are that huge of a deal. With that said, it is kind of insulting to the audience that the movie apparently thinks that we couldn't remember that Al Ghazi, you know, what like didn't like seeing the the general beat Haytham. Like the there's this brief flashback. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that was there when the movie was much longer, and they just didn't remove it. Maybe it was a studio note, I don't know. But it's, yeah. Adam asks for a lollipop for his low blood sugar. And he asks Jan specifically underlining that she carries those. So at the end of the movie, when she's giving one to a Muslim girl, it didn't come out of nowhere. She does just carry those. And I think at least once... I, I'm not sure it's more than once, but I'm almost certain at least once in the movie... She herself is eating a lollipop, do, do, do. consuming a lollipop. That's what I'll go with. Now, it is kind of gross how much we see Americans talking about the people that died in the attack when Muslims did die as well, but we really don't have very many scenes of Muslims like being emotion like being upset about the the dead in in the terrorist attack so that's I mean I I think maybe what they're going for is this idea that the you know Muslims feel like they can't show emotion in public or something but and and certainly also because a lot of the Muslims we do see are the people that have to like, they're basically the protection detail for the, the four feds. But it, it, it wouldn't have been difficult to, to fit it in there. When the, when the four feds go to the, the compound and talk to the people. And... So, let's see, the, the, um, yeah, not very long after Sykes is denied access to the waterhole, one of the Saudis guarding the area is wearing a black ski mask covering everything but his eyes, and there's this ominous close-up of him. Are we supposed to think that he he's one of the terrorists and, I don't know, just hoping that he'll get into a situation where he can get off some shots? at the FBI, I mean, if so, he must realize that his fellow guards will probably put him down immediately for doing so, and I mean, if he's fine with that, then why doesn't he try to, get, like, I, I really don't understand what they were going for with that shot. I do really appreciate that clearly Al Ghazi is relieved that the FBI team have permission to investigate. He's not just allowing it. He does want them to investigate. He wants the crime to be solved. And according to this movie, that couldn't happen without the FBI or at least some American law enforcement there. I've, I've had trouble ascertaining if that is, if, if in 2007, or actually that's the thing, I mean, it's, it's, like, based on these other attacks from, like, 2003, I'm not 100% certain if the movie is set in 2007 or but, yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% certain if the, the Saudi, you know, law enforcement, if they had good, um, if they knew a lot about crime scene investigating. It's kind of hard to believe that Flurry taking down the Saudi military guy would go as well as it does, that it wouldn't lead to more of a conflict with the Saudi military, but I do think it is nice that Flurry defends Al Ghazi 
and it again it's it's this thing that like makes it look like muslims are these violent shouty angry people and I do I Let's see. I I it's kind of funny when Adam you know, he clearly does not like holding that bird. He's incredibly uncomfortable. And Flurry, you know, before we saw him pressure these, you know, pe people back in America, now he's, you know, doing it with the, the prince. Flurry, El Ghazi, and the former bomb maker, I, I think they may have said his name, but I, I missed it is a compelling scene, like the, the profiling of Abu Hamza through what the bomb maker knows from his personal experience and the details about the bomb making. You know, there's some some really excellent, you know, he, he says this thing of the, yeah, I, I should, okay, I'll just very, very briefly, you know, the bomb maker says that the, the, It's difficult to catch someone who can, you know, do these these bombs and then, like, sleep well at night. And Flurry's like, how does he know that he slept well? Because he's still doing it. You, you know, you, you keep doing this kind of thing until the faces of the dead won't let you sleep. And, and you know... The reason that the, the retired bomb maker quit was that 17 days without sleep will make you quit anything. And El Ghazi has gotten so used to translating everything the bomb maker says that when the bomb maker speaks English to Flurry, El Ghazi translates that as well. I can say from personal experience, that is something that happens if you spend a long time translating. You know, you, you end up forgetting because because if you speak multiple languages and you speak them fluently, then it's it's like you you know you don't necessarily think of yeah you know I I personally use the you know the several languages I speak basically interchangeably a lot when I talk to regular people I and and yeah and anyway let's. See. But yeah, I literally, I had a situation, I experienced something where I was translating stuff for someone and, and suddenly I was translating something that, you know, that they already understand. It's like, oh, right. Now, I agree with those who say that it's ridiculous that Flurry just ignores so many visual red flags leading up to the attack. And, you know, the other reviewer points out, I mean... How how else do you make the scene work? And yeah, sadly, that is and and I mean if Flurry didn't notice the red flags at all, then that's you know, that's also a problem. It's like what does it uh, yeah. So yeah, the climax begins an hour and fifteen minutes in, so I think it's maybe twenty minutes from when the the first explosion on the road. I would say that by the time the climax starts, let's see. Yeah, Al Ghazi basically does feel like one of the guys. He's an honorary member of the FBI team. They're not talking to him like he's still a foreigner that they're forced to work with. They talk to him like they trust him, like a member of the team. I do appreciate that they have Al Ghazi say that the region they're in is dangerous. You know, so some people watched the movie and took away from it that all of Saudi Arabia is incredibly dangerous. And 
yeah, it's it's frustrating that for some like I think the idea is supposed to be like I mean there there are places in America where you wouldn't go where there's like gang violence, you know, so I th I think it's supposed to be similar to that and I honestly don't know enough about Riyadh to say if if it's accurate that cuz I think they say a specific Kuku Sawadi I I don't I don't remember but I think they did specify I've seen this movie several times I know that they don't end up killing Adam they don't cut you know they don't cut it's, you know, they, they don't, like, even cut a hair off his head or cut his nails or something, you know. And yet, the, the scene, you know, I'm like, I'm terrified that he's about to be murdered. Or the scene of him being terrified that he's about to be murdered on camera is still incredibly intense. And, yeah, you know, they're like, punch him and such. What I'm saying is, he doesn't end up getting killed. And the... Let's see. It's pretty silly that Janet didn't manage to pick up that Adam was telling her there was another guy in the room, but I, you know, they really badly wanted that fight, and it is a cool fight. Did I see that right? Did she bite the guy's ear? I, I think actually, I think on the commentary track, Peter Berg calls that out and says she did, uh, ah, yeah, you know, the, the boxer. I, f I forget his name right. Mike Tyson? She pulled the Mike Tyson, something like that. And she ends the fight by stag stabbing him in the groin and then the head. I think that's supposed to be female empowerment. And, you know, Janet is, is you know, going going into the room and, and like, the the woman and her, her daughter are scared of, of the gun. So Janet hides the gun and then she hands the little girl a lollipop. And the girl opens her hand, and there is a marble, and the stinger noise makes sure we know this is indeed a bad sign. Of all the good guys who could get shot, of course, Al-Ghazi, one of the only Muslims that are really humanized in this movie, is, is the one who shot. It's not one of the four feds. You know, at the start of the movie, it's, it's the start of the movie, at the start of the Saudi Arabia scenes with the feds in them, he actually asks, do you have bulletproof vests? I don't know why. Clearly, bullets instinctively, like, avoid hitting them. Like, bullets and rockets, just, it's ridiculous. And the, the you know, when the, when the car is, is attacked, like, it, flies in the air, flips over, lands upside down, then they crawl out and they walk as if, well, run, but they, you know, they're not acting like people who've just been in, like, you can, you can get badly hurt in a car doing way less than that. Now, yeah, so the, the action portion of the climax ends maybe an hour and 30, 35 minutes in or so. And Flurry offers condolences to the family of El Ghazi. I like that one of the first things and one of the last things we see Flurry do is talk to a kid whose father was just killed. The first time it's an FBI agent, the second time it's Al Ghazi, the Saudi colonel. But again, it is it's saying there are Muslims dying in this fight too, who are good guys. You know, there are there are tons of Muslims who are good people. And they're putting their lives on the line to stop terrorists. And sometimes they die as well. And the FBI team say goodbye to Haytham right before leaving on the plane. So I guess this is where the original script had him detonate a bomb that killed the FBI agents. And we get the emotional gut punch of Adam asking Flurry what he said to Janet. And the grandchild is asked by, I think his mother... What Abu Hamza, yeah, Abu Hamza's grandchild, why, what Abu Hamza said to him, and both of them said, we're going to kill them all. I, I do still find that it, it really works, but I, understand, I respect that there are some people who find that it completely 
it, it doesn't work at all. And, and apparently some people took away from it that, you know, the, the, some, some American viewers watched the movie and took away from that particular line that Americans needed to go even harder ag against, you know, Muslims so that the, you know, they, they didn't realize, oh, you know, vicious cycle, we're just perpetuating violence. Is this ever going to have, a, you know, no, they just, it made them even angrier. Notes taken before watching. I think it may have been a mistake for the movie to open on one of the suicide bombers basically posing as a normal Muslim. Let's see. The, yeah, the, the bomber who seems to be there to help people get to safety. This means that a lot of Americans watching will be trying to figure out which Muslims are the next secret suicide bombers instead of being more open to their humanity. It's pretty rich that the film goes into Saudi police brutality, whipping the wrong man to interrogate him, without acknowledging American police brutality. And I'll grant, you know, Flurry says, America isn't perfect, I'll be the first one to say that. Let's be honest, that line is just there to, like, he doesn't point to anything. He doesn't say, I wish we did better on this, this, and this. It's, it's just so it doesn't sound as arrogant when he says... We're good at cap we're good at capturing criminals. You know, so so let us do that on you know Saudi soil. But yeah, American police brutality, no whipping, sure, but they'll kill black kids. And I'll grant that you know the the there was substantially fewer videos of violence against black people, police violence against black people when this film came out, but some people did know about it, and it could have been in this film with enough research. And, you know, the Saudi police brutality doesn't need to be in the film, it's just an us versus them thing. Again, I get why it wasn't cut out completely, because at the start of the movie, like, I mean, they would basically have had to film the, the, let's see, yeah, basically, like, you need to, the, they already had the, the stuff of early on, it's the general in charge of the investigation, and then Fleury convinces the prince to put the colonel in charge of the investigation. And from then on, they have a much easier time investigating. You know, the hypothetically, e they would either have had to film alternate takes where it's not the general in charge of the investigation early on, or they would have had to just drop all of that footage, and yeah, at least some of it is definitely necessary for the film to, to work. Now, I guess it's because the movie is so in favor of American law enforcement and loves the fact that American cops will stand up for each other even when they're clearly in the wrong. And it's true, some Saudi law enforcement use whipping, but then it's also true that in Gitmo, people who haven't been proven to have done anything wrong are waterboarded. Out of the two, speaking only for myself, I'll take the whipping. I agree that some of the climax has a we got him, take that evildoers thing to it, but then we have the line that reminds us that's how they feel when, you know, that, that's how we feel when, when terrorists are killed, but that's also how terrorists feel when they successfully suicide bomb. I don't think it's a cop-out, but I respect those who feel that way. So some people really hate that near the end of they find the bomb maker because a teenage girl has a marble. 
I agree that it's extremely convenient, but I do think the idea is decent. Like, this little girl realized that, you know, Abu Hamza, like, let's see. Yeah, she realized that her grandfather, or maybe, yeah, I'm almost certain it's supposed to her be her grandfather, is using these marbles, and she thinks they're pretty, so she wants one, and either she asked pretty, please, can I have one, you know, maybe they're like, well, we, I, I mean, if they have enough of them, then sure, they can, they can spare at least one, or maybe she pockets one when no one is looking, and then when she meets Jennifer Garner, who hands her a lollipop, it's perfectly natural as a threat. Like, she figures Jennifer Garner would also like the marble. And she's not exactly wrong. It's just not for the reason that... Yeah. Let's see. Which, obviously, she realizes afterwards. So, yes, briefly, the... the once, once again, I, I looked for the, ah, what's it called, the, I, I searched YouTube for videos talking about this movie, I found like one review, and other than that, just the two trailers, but yeah, the, the trailers are good, you know, one of them shows the attack on the compound, and the FBI agents leaving and working, clips of the major set pieces, and the other one focuses more on Al Ghazi. They're both really great trailers, and the, the second one is actually also actually high quality, like visually, like the other one, I don't know if it was the, the codec or w what exactly, but it's, it's not the best visual quality now. Okay, so I gotta rush through this. There's a bunch of DD special features, so I'm just gonna hit the, the Cliff's Notes. So, the, let's see, yeah, so the, the commentary, and it's only featuring the director. The, let's see, yeah, he brings up that, you know, an Arabic actor was a problem with the studio, and... The yeah he it was intentional that the comic relief was the guy who got caught and almost killed so that it would make it more real that you know you wouldn't expect him to something to happen to him and Chris Cooper did not complain despite standing for fourteen hours in mud in the heat and Peter Berg was surprised when he saw teenagers or young people in Saudi Arabia playing video games he says Al Ghazi is like a young Robert De Niro He's very proud of the people who handled the action scenes. And Jeremy Piven, it was the actor's idea for him to take pick up one of the, the assault rifles during the monologue. And there's actually the on, on the DVD, elsewhere on the DVD, you see like they they have more than one take of that, which I think is also that explains the continuity gaff. You know, he they did two takes where he picked up the gun in two different ways or something like that. But on one of the takes, like right after he did it, Peter Berg literally tells Jeremy Piven, "You're way too Al Pacino and Scarface. I need you to dial it down a little bit." You know, and it kind of was, yeah. It it was he was a little too eager to like the character is supposed to not have touched a gun in like. I, I guess possibly ever do do diplomats get militia any weapons training I'm not entirely sure and yeah the the 
you know, the, the very end, after the climax, after the climax of Haytham using a suicide bomb killing the leads, the straight up Peter Berg thought that was just too depressing. And let's see. Yeah, and there are some deleted scenes. I mean, I think it's just. Several of the the I think le less like less deleted scenes and kind of just extended but I, I could be wrong about some of it. Now then there is the yeah, there's something called constructing the freeway sequence. Let's see. We spent most, yeah, the director says, we spent most of the movie, I, I'm not certain if this is the right, I'm, I'm just, I'm quoting him directly, cocking a very large bow in the last third, we just released it. It took very careful planning, they had to learn a lot of information, safety, and we, we see that Peter is giving them direction as Jason is being pulled out of the, the upturned car. He's both giving them physical direction and he's telling them specifically what to say. He gets Jennifer Garner to say the F word like two or three times, which judging by Alias commentary tracks, I think her mother might have been very upset by that. Now, let's see. Right, and yeah, there's there's one thing called creating the kingdom. When they talk about the stunts and such, J Jason Bateman quips that they do this sort of thing on Arrested Development all the time, so it's actually kind of boring for him. And they learned s somewhat the real FBI skills, so it would look real when they did it, so they'd act based on that. And, you know, in, in one bit, you know, they're, they're dealing with the, the action scenes. Jennifer and Jason Bateman are, are walking and Jason says, we want to go back on TV. <laughs> Which is legitimately funny. Like, it's, yeah. And that brings us to the final section. Critic sites, MDB, and Wikipedia. I am just going to skim rather than spend a really long time getting into every individual thing that there is. It's kind of wild that there actually are reviews of this that say that they're just glad that it's not very political, or they they think it's it's good that it it's so accurate when depicting American federal agents involved in action. It's like, have you ne like do you do you not realize how completely yeah like this? There's one person here who said unbelievable gunfights. I don't know if they mean that as a positive or as a negative. If they're saying this movie, I just the the gunfights, I I can't they're they're they string credulity. I can't believe them. Bad movie. Or if they're saying, oh, those gunfights, they were unbelievable. You know, so because really, I could see both. But yeah, there are some people who actually say that you know it's it's good that the that when you see the Americans kick ass, it's it's not like even no matter how much you might love this movie, you gotta admit it's clearly not a realistic depiction of the the fighting, you know the the ah what's the word 
obviously it wouldn't be like that in real life, but I mean, some people just watch too many movies. I should know, I'm one of them. Here we go, IMDb Trivia. Originally, this film was much longer and larger in scope, running approximately two and a half hours. This is the cut that director Peter Berg wanted to release, which featured more character development, more dramatic overtones to the story. Universal balked at the idea and forced Berg to cut down the film to its current length, much to his dismay. Yeah. Sadly, it, it does show. They, they balked. I hope they cleaned up after themselves. And let's see. Robert De Niro was originally pursued for the role of FBI Director Grace, now played by Richard Jenkins. I mean, it's such a small role. I don't know, maybe it was bigger in the... Maybe it was bigger back when it was uncut. I don't know. And, yeah, so here we have the... Yeah, also MGV Trivia. An earlier draft of the script had Sergeant Haytham being extremely disaffected after being tortured by his own government for his suspected involvement in the bombing. The earlier ending had Al Ghazi surviving, but instead Haytham says goodbye to the FBI team at the airbase with a hidden bomb strapped to his vest. Sykes take, tackles Haytham away from the group, but Haytham detonates it before Sykes can get clear. I'm not 100% certain if, I, I guess that means that only Sykes dies in that, from how it's written. Now, let's see. Yeah, so there, the IMDb currently has 332 user reviews. And I would definitely say, like, you, you know, if you just read the 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 top ones, you can understand why they're the most the the ones voted the most useful. Now I. A lot of people complaining about shaky cam. There are there are other complaints as well. Some people saying that it's a movie that hates Muslims. Some people saying it's a movie that hates America. There are some people pointing out that it's basically, there are several separate movies that are kind of awkwardly glued together, and I agree, that is, it is a frustrating aspect of this movie, that, like, hypothetically, if this movie was only an action movie, or if it was only this police procedural with these political overtones, that would work a lot better, but without the action scenes, a lot less people would have watched it, you know, I mean, there were prob probably a lot of people who felt like the trailer guaranteed them non-stop action, and yeah, that is basically true, but imagine if the trailer had no action, or still had the action, but it wasn't in the movie, it's just, there, there are certain expectations from American movies, and yeah, so sometimes that can really make a movie a lot less compelling than it wanted to be. Now, on the IMDb external reviews section, there are 238 links. I was able to copy in 82. The rest of them are dead links, languages I don't speak, and that kind of thing. Now, let's see, I am just going to, yeah. 
one criticism was that it makes it look really easy to go and find the terrorists. And, you know, basically that it's just some some American politicians not having the courage to just kick down the door and go deal with the terrorists. And that really is a big problem with movies like this. And the, the thing is, I mean, I don't know what... I'm not sure of, it's very likely for an American movie to be made about this without having something like, you know, an ending... Not necessarily this exact same ending, but something similar. I'm almost certain that the, let's see, it's just, yeah, I, I think it would be, yeah, okay, so, I am spoiling the ending of All Quiet on the Western Front, the most, ah, uh, one second, I don't remember exactly when it, the, the not not the original, but the remake, you know. That movie ends with the protagonist, after years fighting the war, is killed by someone we don't we don't even see. It's just, you know, he he Yeah, he he was he he wanted to, to draw a um what are they called? Not not bird, but there's that meme of the guy who thinks it is a bird, butterfly, I think it's called, and yeah, he for for just a few seconds he you know he he stands up a little too much in the in the trenches of World War One and he's shot. I think that kind of ending could maybe have worked here, you know have have it, you know maybe they do basically find. Yeah, actually, yeah, here we go. Have them find out who did it and where, but then when they go there, it's empty. Similar to how, let me think, in Afghanistan, was it the camps maybe? I think it was that the U.S. bombed some camps where they had trained, where Al-Qaeda had trained, but by the time they bombed them, they were empty. You know, have something like that. Have it be that they get there, but it's just too late. There's too many... There's too many people, it's too many, you know, it's it's impossible to, and then because they went there, they get attacked and maybe even killed. That could help communicate to to an American movie-going audience that it's more complicated and it's not just about sending a bunch of cowboys down there. Okay, no more spoilers for All Quiet on the Western Front. But yeah, the the fact that it does basically indulge in the the cowboy attitude there at the end, it yeah, it's a it is a frustrating movie that it's it's it would be great if they could have just either made this sort of yeah, this this thriller about how difficult it is to track down terrorists the the but without any of the action scenes my my ideal version of this movie every character is Saudi it's purely set in Saudi Arabia and the actually yeah maybe the the Okay, every major character is Saudi Arabian, and the maybe maybe some Saudi Arabians go and interrogate some. I mean, not interrogate. They they ask some questions from witnesses that are Americans, but other than that, the movie is not about Americans, and it's showing these Saudis trying to solve this, you know, fig figure out where the terrorists are hiding, so that they can. Ah, uh, what's the word? Yeah, so, uh, you know, noting that they they don't want people to die and just maybe have a line or two in there about 
how it's really the the uh, you know that yeah that it's difficult to protect Americans in Saudi Arabia because there are some people who hate them with a passion you know something like that I th that would probably be the very best but yeah as I've already talked about that movie would not get a lot of money in America at least not in 2007 I guess there's a chance that it might I don't know I'm maybe maybe not today either but yeah that is everything that I wanted to say about the movie so I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoy watching and recording and I'll catch you next time